Do you remember early August? You might have been at the beach. Aperol spritz in one hand, smartphone in the other, scrolling through headlines about cratering markets and this thing called the carry trade. It involved the yen and a lot of money. Don't worry if you can't recall it. It probably wasn't the highlight of your vacation. And we're going to get into all of it in this pod. Because while that market panic seemed to end almost as quickly as it began, the carry trade still looms large over markets. And Japan is at the centre of it all. So on this week's episode, we're looking at the carry trade. It's what we do here on Reuters Econ World. Every week, we pick a phrase or buzzword and go deep on the economic principles and ideas driving the biggest news around the world. I'm your host, Carmel Crimmins, in Dublin. Okay, first things first, let's get our definitions straight. We need to explain what a carry trade is. So it's actually an investment strategy where you borrow at a lower interest rate and invest the money you've borrowed in assets with higher returns. Pocketing the difference. The strategy is particularly popular on foreign exchange markets. Traders borrow in currencies where rates are low and put that money to work in economies where rates are high. And one currency has dominated foreign exchange carry trades, the yen. That's because for years, the Bank of Japan kept its interest rates below zero when other central banks had raised theirs. That was good news for investors, but a carry trade can quickly turn into bad news if the interest rate gap narrows and the investor gets squeezed. That's what happened over the summer. The Bank of Japan increased rates for a second time and concerns about the US economy raised questions about the size of the US-Japan interest rate gap. So after all that frenzied selling, is the Japan carry trade risk really a thing of the past? What about the trillions of dollars worth of Japanese investments still held on global markets? What happens to that as Japan tries to slowly lift interest rates? And how definite is the path the Bank of Japan will take? Here to parse all this, we've two experts on Japan and the carry trade. In Singapore, we video Ranganthan our global breaking news editor for finance and markets. And in Tokyo, we've Leika Kiara, our veteran Bank of Japan correspondent. Leika and Vidya, welcome. Thank you, Kamu. Glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. So Vidya, back in late July, early August, we had like a confluence of events that caused huge market turbulence. And the peak of the stress was in Japan, where the main stock index tumbled 12% in one day. Quite the shock. And it was suddenly like the rug had been pulled under this yen carry trade, which by conservative estimates is runs to up, say, $100 billion. But then the more wider estimates of it range up to going to 4 to $5 trillion. So do we know how much was actually unwound in terms of the carry trade back in August? So to throw your question back at you, do we know how much of yen funded carry trades are there in the world? No, we don't. So, so how do you estimate what was unbound and whether it was really a yen carry trade? There is no estimate and there's no way to estimate how much is there and therefore how much has been unbound. If you look at how much of the Japanese have in foreign markets, it's portfolio investments, it's about $4.7 trillion. $4.7 trillion. Trillion. In, and mo- half of it is invested in debt. So. Then this is just the money that Japan's given out into the world. If you're a hedge fund or if you're a leveraged player in the stock market, have you levered up three times, four times, 10 times and magnified that? Okay. So that's the scale we are talking about here. Leiko, was the Bank of Japan surprised by the market reaction to their rate hike? Right. They actually thought they were telegraphing their message pretty clearly. So when the BOJ saw what they did to the markets, they probably panicked and thought without modifying their communication, they could trigger a a global stock free fall. So what they did was the deputy governor happened to have a chance to speak 
in the northern tip of Japan. It was a pre-organized setting, but he used it to communicate that the BOJ will not raise while markets were unstable. You know, it doesn't really say much beyond what's obvious that central banks do not act when markets are volatile, but he said it twice. He repeated that message in a news conference. So you know that he wanted to get a very dovish message across to calm markets. So that worked, but that also backfired by getting markets excited saying, oh, okay, the BOJ won't raise rates for a very long time. But that wasn't precisely what the BOJ was trying to say. They were only saying that, okay, when markets are volatile, we, we will stand pat. But once it stabilizes, we will surely resume our rate hike path. So that's a very ambiguous and complex message to communicate to markets keen to jump on a very clear, straightforward message and trade. How do we get to this point, Leica, where Japan holds trillions of dollars in overseas investments, where it's the world's biggest creditor? Well, what first happened was that Japan um, experienced a huge asset inflated bubble which burst and created huge banking sector problems and the economy struggled, which means for the central bank, they needed to push down borrowing costs and interest rates to save the banks, save the economy. And because the debt was so big, it took a very long time to unwind. And if you have a lot of debt, you don't really spend money. You just try to pay back your debt. Mm -hmm which means consumption and corporate spending remain very slow despite very low interest rates. This happened for a long time. What it meant for investors was that investors needed to find somewhere else to invest their money because you really don't yield much by parking funds in Japan. And as Japan slowly starts increasing interest rates, the danger is that there might be a disorderly reversal of these decades-long capital outflows. So does that worry Bank of Japan officials? Yeah, cer certainly, yes. You know, th they are dealing with several different asset players. First of all, you don't want to trigger a sharp bond yield rise by being too hawkish because Japan is settled with huge public debt, which means that if bond yields rise, the cost of funding your public debt balloons. That's the last thing you want to do. So you need to be sort of very kind of cautiously hawkish yeah. in making sure you don't trigger a bond yield spike. But on the other hand, if you're too dovish, you let these yen carry trades build up again and cause the yen to weaken. So they're trying to kind of juggle a lot of different things. On top of the wall of money that the Bank of Japan needs to navigate, they also need to navigate Japanese politics. And a new prime minister, Shigeru Ishiba, Tell us about him. You know, we actually interviewed him before he even decided to run in the ruling party leadership race. And back then, he was clearly hawkish, saying the BOJ needs to end this very abnormal, easy monetary policy framework. So, you know, markets would assume that he would retain that hawkish message or at least endorse moderate slow interest rate rises. But what happened was that immediately after he was appointed prime minister, he met the BOJ governor. And shortly after, he spoke to reporters saying, I personally do not think Japan is ready for further interest rate rises. That's a very clear, explicit intervention in central banking or monetary policy you don't usually see. It's also a big flip-flop, right? He's, he's gone from being a hawk to being a dove. Exactly. But what I think is happening is you're going to have a general election later this month. And you need to kind of rally up or kind of get the support of a party that is very fragmented. You have big fans of easy monetary policy within your party. You need to get them together so that they can win this general election. And when you're heading into a general election in Japan, you do not endorse higher borrowing costs because that would hurt households, that would hurt the smaller firms. After the election, his comments might change because in nature, he is a hawk. We, we all know that. 
but it's just the timing. Right. And the need to really make sure that you're not rocking the boat, you're not jolting markets. But if Shiba has put the kibosh on any rate increase anytime soon, how difficult has he made things for the Bank of Japan? That's a good question. By being so explicit in his rate hike comment, Ishiba probably made life much more difficult for the BOJ because for the BOJ, if you kind of hold off on raising rates for too long after Ishiba made that comment, it gives market the impression that the central bank is really paying a lot of attention to politics and politicians kind of meddling into central bank affairs. You don't want to cause that message. But in reality, if, if the prime minister is asking for the BOJ to hold off on raise, raising rates, going against that request and actually raising rates is very costly. You know, what if the economy tanks straight after you raise rates? It might not because, be because of the BOJ's rate hike, but you get all the heat and the blame. You'll get the blame. Yeah. So in, in many ways, the best thing a political leader can do is just to shut up and stay quiet. But, you know, you can't expect that in Japan where, you know, yen moves, central banks are so important and politically engaging and sensitive. So I guess the BOJ would have to deal with it. And they've been used to this throughout most of BOJ's modern history. They were under political heat to, to loosen monetary policy further. Now, it might be the other way around. It might be more complex, but politics and central banking are so interwined in Japan that, yes, Ishiba was another kind of headache for them, but not surprising in any way. It's just another leader they have to deal with. Japan's switch back to a more normal monetary policy isn't just precarious for global financial markets. Some of Japan's rural areas are still struggling with weak demand and low growth and are worried higher interest rates will make it worse, including the birthplace of the Bank of Japan governor. Sakura Murakami went to visit it. Sakura, tell us about Makinohara. So Makinohara, it's, it's a breezy surf town in Shizuoka, which once thrived, especially during the 80s and 90s, on the tea industry, but has seen a decline in recent years as domestic demand for tea has weakened and its population has declined. How did the people there feel about Governor Ueda's interest rate increases? The sense that I got was that people were very proud of him. He's like the most famous son from Makinohara right now, and he's representing Japan to the world. But I did get a sense of ambivalence and maybe some hesitation over his policies. One business owner I talked to was Yoshimaru Suzuki, and he felt that Ueda's decision to raise rates at this point was too early. He took out a pen and like drew on the whiteboards, that, like showing like the curves of how the economy sort of grows and ebbs and flows, basically. And he was saying Japan's economy has hit a low, and it's at this point, it's just looking up. It's just beginning to kind of gather that momentum to, for things to actually get better. But with the rate hike, that's going to sort of stem that momentum. It's going to stop it. And the way he described it was like, why would you be hitting the brakes just when things are getting better, basically? NVIDIA, is it possible to say where the pressure points would be in the market? Could you give us a sense of like, sort of the range of investments that are funded by borrowings in the yen? So the biggest one, I would, I would say, is out of the 4.7 trillion that Japan has as portfolio investments in the outside world, half of it is in long-term bonds. Now, how much of it is in U.S. treasuries or in U.S. money market funds? That's one of the biggest worries when we start talking about this. That's one of the first things we looked at is is this going to mean a huge selling of U.S. treasuries? The other one, I, I think, is whether the, some of the Japanese big banks will incur huge losses on their holdings of foreign bonds as the yen suddenly appreciates. That's one of the more vulnerable points. So, so overall, I would say the amount of leveraged money in global stock market, yes, that's the headline news. That's the money that's gone into, say, the U.S. tech trade, things like that. 
yeah, it's it's the U.S. trade, trade, trade. like people were pointing to, pointing to Nvidia's collapse and saying, "Hey, this is all related to the end carry trade." But in terms of financial stability, I think it's the money that comes out of the global debt markets, particularly the eurozone and the U.S. sovereign debt or high investment grade debt. That's going to be, I guess, the more worrisome factor for central bankers. You know, in terms of the interest rate differential, there's still a lot to play with there for investors. Right, Vidya? Like there's still, it still makes sense to borrow in yen. Yeah, it's not like the spread has collapsed. But as they say, the, the juice in this trade is not determined just by the interest rate differential. It's determined by two things. One is the volatility. And the second is that predictability about the yen's path. It had, has had been depreciating. It has been depreciating. And once you take away that certainty that it's going to go in a certain direction, then the trade becomes really fickle and risky. The the election that we're expecting later this year, Ishiba's party, the LDP, is expected to retain control. But if he loses a lot of seats, would he be under pressure to keep the BOJ under pressure, not to raise rates by too much? In other words, does the kind of the political makeup matter after this election? What happens is that if he does not retain enough seats and his political standing within his own party is shaky, that would undermine his view that the BOJ must keep raised rates because there is a a, a fairly powerful camp within the party advocating low rates to continue for much longer. So all in all, it's very important for the BOJ that Ishiba wins enough seats so he becomes a solid political leader. Timing is everything in life, but especially so in monetary policy. And the Bank of Japan is now hiking rates while all other major central banks are cutting. Is their timing very unfortunate, Leica? It's unfortunate and um, they had good reason to wait this long. But because of that, you know, whatever small step they take always causes some sort of market turbulence. So in a way, they made their life more difficult by waiting for such a long time. There are people who argue against that view, but it is true that they're stuck in a situation where they're the sole dove finally starting to raise rates at a time when all the other central banks have done and moving in the reverse direction. So we will likely see more market turbulence, whatever the BOJ does. Before we sign off, I want to give a shout out to a great podcast that's launched this week. It's called The Big View and it's anchored by my colleague, Peter Thal Larson. Peter is the global editor of Breaking Views, Reuters financial commentary team. And he's here to tell us all about the show and this week's episode. So The Big View, Peter, give us the elevator pitch. Well, at Breaking Views, we have a a global network of, of columnists who spend all their time talking to senior and interesting contacts in business, in finance, in policymaking worlds. And what we really wanted to do with this podcast is to try to bring some of those people out of the shadows a little bit and get them onto a show to talk about some of the really big, important questions that we write about every day in our columns. Sounds great. Like Econ World, your episode this week has a Japanese theme. What's it about? Yeah, so we've talked to Lionel Barber, who is the former editor of the Financial Times. And Lionel spent the last few years researching and writing a biography of Masayoshi Son. And this is someone who is not a household name, but is probably the biggest tech tycoon that you've never heard of. He has built this vast empire, this business called SoftBank, which again is not a household name, but in the process, he has poured loads of money into WeWork, which built up a huge valuation and then went horribly wrong. He persuaded the Saudi crown prince to give him tens of billions of dollars for a fund to invest in technology. And he's done various other kind of like dramatic things in technology. So he's shaped technology for good or for ill, but really while remaining a little bit below the radar in terms of being a household name. Until now, Peter, I'm looking forward to listening. Thank you, Carmel. A big thank you to Leika Kiara, Vidya Ranganthan, Sakura Murakami, and everyone who covers finance, markets, and macroeconomics at Reuters. You can read their work on Reuters.com and the Reuters app. 
You can also listen to the Big View podcast there or wherever you get your podcasts. Sound design, music composition and engineering on this episode was by Josh Summer. Our podcast team includes Kim Vanell, Tara Oakes, Gail Issa, Christopher Wall Jasper, Jonah Green, David Spencer and Sharon Reich Garson. Our executive producer is Leela de Kretzer. Remember, for all your daily news, check out our weekday show, Reuters World News. You can catch it on the Reuters app or wherever you listen to your podcasts. <laughs>